exciting topic. It's it's the second half of the um, Rotary Foundation presentation, and it's on promoting peace and Polio Plus. We have two great um, speakers this evening, uh, Kathy Dick and Badar Shamim, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items first. Um, while the presentation's happening, if you could please be on mute uh, so that we can minimize any background noise, that would be great. Um, we will ask you to unmute yourself when it's question time. So if you do have a question, we'll, we'll invite you to uh, unmute at that point. Uh, we have enabled the chat. Uh, so if you do have any questions, uh, we talked to Kathy um, and Bedar beforehand. Um, if you have a question that you'd really like to be answered during the presentation, please put your question in chat. And Suzanne is going to be our moderator today, so she'll be monitoring it. And if she thinks it's appropriate for us to, when there's a break in, in um, them speaking, we'll ask that question. If not, we'll hold the questions till the end. Um, so Suzanne will kind of make that decision. But if it is a question that you really want answered right away, put it in the chat that you'd really like it answered right away and we'll make sure that it gets it gets brought up. Uh, we are recording the session, um, so I, I believe that's already happened. So let me introduce our two speakers for this evening. Uh, we have Kathy Dick. Uh, Kathy joined Cambridge North Rotary in 2007, where she served as president in 2013 and 2014. She also served as district governor in the 2017-2018 year. Kathy resides in Mississauga and is a member of the Rotary Mississauga where she is the Peace and Environmental Chair. She is currently the chair of the District 7080 Peace Committee. Let me introduce to you Badar. Uh, he is a member of the Rotary Club of Brampton since 2005 and is the, currently the president-elect. Uh, he has previously served as the club uh, Director International Services, as well as Director Community Service, and will be serving as the club VP during the upcoming Rotary year. A Brock University grad and a portfolio manager by profession, Badar has worked in the investment industry for over 21 years. Badar is a past chair and a lifetime member of his regional chamber and also serves as the director on the board of Canada Turkey Business Council and a Canadian trade and investment advocacy organization promoting bilateral econo economic relations between Canada and our G20 NATO, NATO allies in Turkey. Badar is married to Sema Beza, did I pronounce that right? Uh, since 2011 and in their free time, they love to golf and travel. I'm gonna send it over to Kathy now. Thank you very much, Mary. Let me just get this presentation up here. <clears throat> ah. There we go. I just have to minimize everybody on the side because it's distracting. <laughs> okay, here we go. Rotary and peace. Rotary's goal of worldwide peace and tolerance is in our DNA. We have an over 77 year collaboration with the United Nations. We are all members of the largest and longest serving peace, uh, longest and largest, uh, longest serving peace building nonprofit in the world. And I'd like to show you a short uh, video right now on um, the beginnings of our relationship with peace. Kathy, is there supposed to be sound? Around the globe. Oh, do you not oh, hear it? It's, it's, I do now. Station of the second. But even as the battles raged, global leaders planned for a new era and a post-war organization for peace. Rotary International, long committed to global cooperation and peace, had been raising awareness of the United Nations publishing articles and pamphlets to encourage the discussion. Finally, 
In June of 1945, the eyes of the world were on San Francisco as delegates from 50 countries gathered to sign the UN Charter. The Conference of the United Nations on International Organization is now convened. Even as they gathered, delegates read the headlines proclaiming the end of the war in Europe. At the invitation of the U.S. Secretary of State, Rotary International sent 11 rotations to serve as consultants to the delegation from the United States. These included two past Rotary presidents, Alan Albert and Tom Davis. In fact, there were Rotarians and honorary members from around the globe, some as official delegates for their nations and others as consultants. Ezequiel Padilla served as chair of the delegation from Mexico. Rotarian Carlos Romulo represented the Philippines and would later serve as president of the fourth session of the UN General Assembly. The Charter of the United Nations is a solid structure upon which we can build for a better world. There was a triumphant ceremony as representatives signed the Charter for their nation. Joseph Salem from Lebanon was just one of the Rotarians who signed the Charter on behalf of their countries. U.S. Secretary of State E.R. Statinius was a signatory for the United States. He later described the invitation to Rotary International as a recognition of the practical part Rotary's members have played and will continue to play in the development of understanding among nations. Rotary's participation in the UN Charter Conference was just the beginning of a humanitarian-focused collaboration that continues. Today, with a vision they have shared since the beginning, the United Nations and Rotary serve as examples of global cooperation as they lead efforts to promote peace, development, and world health. Causes. Peace building is inherent in everything that we do in Rotary. It is an integral part of our polio and disease eradication programs, our WASH programs, our environmental initiatives, as well as our work on basic education and <clears throat> literacy. Excuse me, I have a cold. When we strive to reduce gender disparity in education, we are doing peace work. When we expand access to quality care so mothers and their children can live and grow stronger, we are doing peace work. When we enhance economic and community development and create opportunities for decent and productive work for both young and old, we are doing peace work. And if you notice uh, peace as the, at the core of all of these seven areas, and working in harmony with them. Our most significant effort to wage peace is the Rotary Peace Centers program. Rotary approved the creation of Rotary Peace Centers in 1999. The inaugural class of Rotary Peace Fellows began their studies in 2002. Applications are open right now for Peace Fellows and they close on May the 15th. Waterloo is a place for peace in our district. But before I go on to that, is anybody interested in hearing uh, where the peace centers are in the world? If you are, I can let you know. I would be. Okay, we have um, Chapel Hill, USA, Tokyo, Japan, Bradford, England, Brisbane, Australia, Uppsala, Sweden, Bangkok, Thailand, Makerere uh, University in Kampala, Uganda, and a new one in the Middle East, which is in Istanbul, Turkey. Now we can go on to Waterloo and, and uh, the place for peace. Over 40 years ago, Conrad Grable University College established the first peace studies program at a Canadian university. In 2007, 
philanthropist Jim Balsillie founded the Balsillie School of International Affairs. It's a center for advanced research and teaching on global governance and international public policy. It's a collaborative partnership between Wilfrid Laurier University, the University of Waterloo, and the Center for International Governance Innovation. We're very lucky, very fortunate to have this in our district. In fact, we are um, planning a trip to visit this university and their peace program in uh, April, April the 12th to be exact. This is uh, one of the newer courses that they're offering, which is an integrated peace specialist course. And it integrates uh, peace and conflict studies with global governance. Now I'd like to talk to you about our partnership with the Institute for Economics and Peace. It's an independent think tank and a leader in the study of peace and conflict, which helps address the root causes of conflict that create conditions that foster peace. So we have negative peace and positive peace. Whoops, sorry about that. So what is negative peace? Negative peace is the absence of violence or the fear of violence. Despite its simplicity, it's a deeply profound definition. Peace had often been thought of as simply the absence of war, but it is much more than that. I like to think of negative peace as uh, reactive. And then we have positive peace. Positive peace is the attitudes, institutions, and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. Beyond measuring levels of actual peace, how can we understand what is needed to attain peaceful societies? The Global Peace Index tells us how peaceful a country is, but it doesn't tell us what we should in be investing in to strengthen or maintain levels of peace. Now, I like to think of positive peace as proactive. And if you want to know what makes a peaceful society, we have the eight pillars of peace, positive peace, well-functioning government, equitable distribution of resources, free flow of information, good relations with neighbors, high levels of human capital, acceptance of the rights of others, low levels of corruption, and a sound business environment. All of these things come together to form positive peace in a country. Now, what we have next is the Global Peace Index. It uses the eight pillars of positive peace to determine the most peaceful and least peaceful countries. It's a data-driven analysis. And if you look at the map, you can see who are the most peaceful countries and who are not. Can anybody tell me what the most peaceful country or who the most peaceful country in the world is? Does anybody know? Well, it happens to be Iceland and it has been Iceland for a while. Last year, I, I sent a, a notice to you regarding the 10 top peaceful countries. And this year things have changed a little because we've slipped two places, Canada has. So I'm going to give you the 12 most peaceful countries. Iceland, New Zealand, Ireland, Denmark, Austria, Portugal, Slovenia, Czech Republic, Singapore, Japan, Switzerland, and Canada. Now, does anybody know what the least peaceful country in the world is? No? Is it Syria? Pardon me? Is it Syria? No, it's actually Africa. Afghanistan. 
Oh, it's wow. Afghanistan. Hmm. Afghanistan. Second is Yemen, Syria third, Russia, South Sudan, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Iraq, Somalia, Central African Republic, Sudan, Ukraine, and North Korea. Let me go on to talk now a little bit about the District Peace Committee. Our vision is to actively engage every club in peace building within District 708. Our plan within the next five years is for every club to become a peace builder club, to have the district actively participate in Rotary Presidential Peace Conferences each year, to have a video covering peace initiatives in the district that is available to the public, and District 7080 becomes a peace builder district. Every club becomes a peace builder club. So what is a peace builder club? Peace builder clubs were established in 2018 by the Rotarian Action Group for Peace to champion Rotary clubs worldwide as an essential call to action for Rotarian peace builders. The District Peace Committee has established its own criteria to become a peace builder club and a peace builder district. There is no fee involved in becoming a peace builder club or a district. So what is required to form a, a peace district peace builder club? So you, you have a committee with two or more members and you focus on peacemaking and peace building and you involve youth if possible. You can integrate peace into a club service project or partner with groups outside of Rotary. You can submit a prospective candidate for a Rotary Peace Fellowship. You can participate in peace projects with other clubs. You can join the Rotary Action Group for Peace, which I highly recommend. It's a great resource for peace projects. A lot of the clubs that ask me, um, I don't understand what a peace project is. Well, if you go back to what I said earlier, peace is at the core of everything that Rotary does. And if you think of all of the things that you do in your community, they're all related with peace. If you uh, volunteer at a food bank, that is a peace project. We did an interesting project in Mississauga. We did a, uh, a peace corner. We weren't allowed to call it a park, the city didn't like that, but we installed a peace pole with uh, three languages. And on the peace pole, it says, may peace prevail on earth in French, in English, and in the language of the Mississaugas of the Credit. This was a cluster project in which most of the clubs in Mississauga were involved. We had an opening uh, last July and um, Chief Stacy Laform came along to help out with the opening as well as the city. And I understand that uh, Rotary Mrs. Uh, sorry, Rotary Meadowvale is uh, going to be planting two more peace poles in parks in Mississauga. Isn't that right, Leslie? So that's a good um, that's a good project for anybody. So in a um, nutshell, Kathy, I, I think this is relevant right now. A question. Okay. Um, how much does a peace poll cost and it, would it be eligible for a district grant? Okay, good question. First of all, the cost of the actual peace poll is not overly expensive. Um, I think that uh, what I paid for the poll and the shipping um, came to over $500 um, Canadian. Um, 
I, I'm not sure exactly what it is now. This was a couple of years ago. And uh, yes, we did our, um, our Peace Corner with a district grant. That's how we managed to fund it. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So in a nutshell, this is all you have to do to become a Peace Builder Club. You can form a peace or a peace slash environment committee with two or more members. Our club decided to include environment along with peace because the two of them are so closely connected. And rather than have two separate committees, we formed the one committee doing both peace and the environment together. Do one peace project a year. You can integrate peace into a club service project or submit a candidate for a Rotary Peace Fellowship. Now, um, a peace project, like I say, could be designated. It could be something you already do that you could designate as a peace project. And I should also let you know that this year are applying to become a peace fellow in the district. And last of all, I'd like you to send me the email address of the club's peace committee chair so that I can update them on the latest peace information coming from the Rotary Action Group for Peace and other areas. I like this quote. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, is the only thing that ever has. I'd like to end with something that John Hugo said. He said, all of us gathered here are unofficial diplomats and peace builders of our age. When you build a system for clean water, you are a peace builder. When you help out a student struggling to graduate, you are a peace builder. When you launch any project to support education, health, or economic development in your local community or elsewhere, you are building the optimal conditions for positive peace. So I'd like to end it here. Kathy, we lost your sound there at the very end. Oh, did you? Oh, I can hear you now. Yeah, just. Okay, maybe I should turn my sound up. I'm going to turn it over to Badar right now and he can tell you about polio and the relationship that polio and peace share. Thank you. Thank you, PDG, Kathy. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've learned a lot about, uh, uh, about peace and conflict resolution and as it relates to uh, Rotary's work around it. Uh, so I appreciate uh, this opportunity to now talk a little bit about Polio Plus and how it's all interconnected. As uh, most of you have gone through uh, my formal presentation uh, on Polio Plus, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the presentation. I would rather take this opportunity to create an interactive dialogue between those in attendance uh, and us uh, to build on where uh, PDG Cathy has left the conversation and that is the link between Polio Plus and Polio, Global Polio Eradication Campaign uh, and, uh, um, and uh, peace building. So I'm just gonna go through a little bit of the presentation but not a whole lot. So bear with me as I pull up the presentation, one second. <clears throat> Okay, can everybody see N polio strain? We can now, yep. You can now? Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so now, now we can't. It right. keeps going back I to your it. sharing. You uh, <laughs> it's there now. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so together we can end polio uh, and end polio now are the two symbols uh, that I think uh, every Rotarian uh, is familiar with. Those of, uh, those of us that have been around um, for a while uh, would have been actually following this campaign ever since it started uh, in 19, uh, uh, 1985 in its current iteration or polio plus its iteration. Uh, the important part to, to know about its history is that all of this actually started because of one Rotarian. Uh, there was a district governor, past district governor in Philippines uh, who took it upon himself uh, to eradicate polio from the Philippines after it was already eradicated in North America in 1979. And uh, because of sheer determination and dedication, he, he and his team of Rotarians uh, successfully uh, accomplished that mission. And he managed to impress uh, then Rotary International uh, leadership to the point where uh, after consultations with WHO and uh, UNICEF, uh, Rotary decided to take it upon themselves to make this a global, uh, globally coordinated uh, initiative. The main reasons for why we undertook uh, this as a global initiative remains the same today. It saves lives, it's achievable, it's a good investment because as we have all experienced over the last uh, a few years, uh, when a pandemic uh, starts because of a virus, uh, quite frankly, none, none of us are safe unless uh, all of us are safe. Um, and lastly, uh, as, uh, as also demonstrated over the last two years, it creates the infrastructure to eliminate any future disease. Uh, as a matter of fact, polio was indeed utilized last year uh, to help fight uh, COVID, COVID uh, uh, pandemic as well. Around the world in all the countries, healthcare workers and polio networks are known and trusted in their communities uh, as people who basically work uh, with the community to make sure that uh, uh, both uh, education, education pieces there, as well as uh, people are uh, doing what's necessary to stop a virus from spending, uh, spreading, i.e. Uh, washing hands and wearing masks and things like that. And the infrastructure that we had in place because of polio program was used uh, to contact trace, uh, contact for contact tracing purposes for COVID virus, and also using the call centers uh, for for spreading that information out to the community. Surveillance labs used for COVID nineteen testing um, uh, were were also uh, a part of the benefit of having polio uh, surveillance labs uh, already on the ground. And lastly, the polio plus billboards in Nigeria were used for information on COVID-19, hand, hand washing and social distancing. So, so that's the relevance in that the network that we have created uh, in terms of the Rotarians around the world and their relationships with their respective governments, their respective uh, health organizations, as well as uh, the, the global outfits, i.e. WHO and UNICEF, allows us to basically replicate our work around eliminating polio in case of any other virus uh, or healthcare issue, uh, uh, you know, stemming from virus spreading. In uh, 1979, uh, polio was already eradicated in the United States. And by 1985, there were about 350,000 polio cases in over 123 countries worldwide. And uh, you can, you can see how, uh, how those numbers have decreased over a period of time uh, so that basically we are now looking at uh, uh, only two countries that are still uh, polio endemic. Uh, last year, there were 30 cases of polio uh, that were reported. Uh, 20 of them were reported in Pakistan, eight in Mozambique and two in Afghanistan. Okay, I'm, I'm, on, I'm not gonna use all these slides. Okay, so in order to help spread the word uh, and continue to raise awareness and funds to eliminate polio, uh, we have launched a, a Polio Plus Society in our district. Any Rotarian can join the Polio Plus Society uh, they only have to file, uh, sign a, uh, a pledge form uh, that basically says that they're willing to donate at least $100 US uh, every year until polio is eradicated. 
Uh, it could be any amount uh, over $100, but the minimum is $100. Um, so when we started this fiscal year, we were looking at roughly 19 Polio Plus Society members, and I'm happy to report that that number has already doubled uh, because of uh, the support from Rotarians in our district. Okay, I think I'm not gonna go through the rest of the form formal presentation, and I'm gonna now uh, end this uh, end the end the uh, slides part and make this interactive and connect this with the with our main topic today, which is peace and conflict resolution. Okay, can everybody see me now? I'm just glad it's not my picture anymore. <laughs> I don't know why I was sitting in your top right hand corner. <laughs> that's funny. So, I, guess I'm a, I guess I'm a star. <laughs> that's it, Mary Bray. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the important piece to, to know about the two remaining countries that uh, are currently uh, polio endemic uh, and we're trying to basically uh, rid them of polio is that in Pakistan's case, um, all 20 cases of polio that were reported last year were primarily reported for one small area on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's called North Waziristan. Uh, and historically speaking, uh, for those of you that have an history, uh, that, in, that have an interest in uh, history of the subcontinent, uh, that, that region was known as basically a federally administered tribal area. Um, the, the rules of the federal government never really applied to that region uh, up until very recently. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, some, some seven to eight years ago, that region became a hotbed of Taliban activity, which basically made it impossible for the healthcare workers to reach the 36,000 odd children in that region and vaccinate them against uh, polio. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Facebook reminded me that exactly seven years ago, Pakistani armed forces uh, were carrying out operations in that area, trying to clear it off uh, the Taliban terrorists. Um, so th there's a direct correlation why to this day we still have polio in a small portion of Pakistan uh, and, and, and in Afghanistan. And the main reason is basically the use of fake information, misinformation, by those who don't necessarily want to see Pakistanis and Afghanistan, Af Afghanis build a holistic, trustworthy, mutually beneficial relationship, mutually respectful relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, we all saw what happens with a handful of uh, radical individuals try to stop the government from doing the right thing uh, a a a right here in Canada over the last two years whether it was uh, the people who were trying to stop the traffic from crossing over from Canada into the United States on the Windsor Bridge, or whether it was a bunch of people uh, blocking downtown Ottawa, uh, protesting against the vaccination campaign. Um, unfortunately, there will always be some element of uh, individuals in every society who don't necessarily uh, want to cooperate. And in order to prove their own point, will go to any extreme, uh, uh, extreme uh, activity uh, to basically discredit, uh, for the lack of a better word, better governance. Uh, in case of Pakistan or uh, Afghanistan, where you still have very high level of uh, lack of education, uh, it's even easier to manipulate people and tell them that, you know, oh, the vaccines you're gonna get will make, make your children impotent. That was one of the false information that was used over the years uh, by the radicals in that area to keep government agencies uh, out of out of uh, out of uh, the tribal areas in Pakistan, for instance. Um, so the main purpose of that uh, campaign of misinformation, though, remains the same thing. I.e., it's petty politics uh, where somebody's trying to make a name for themselves uh, and exert their influence on the uneducated masses. Uh, and, and actually is trying to discredit the masses from having faith and trust uh, or better relationships uh, beyond their borders, beyond their regions that basically makes their power uh, weaker for the lack of a better word, right? 
And uh, unfortunately, uh, that went on for a while, uh, but I think we are now in a position in Pakistan where the government, as well as uh, the tribal elders uh, in that region are completely on board uh, with uh, polio eradication. Uh, and, you know, it, there was a time, I, I, I was part of a friendship team that visited Pakistan in 2018. Uh, and unfortunately, while me, Norm, Mia Manson from RC Oakwell, uh, and Hajar Wilson, my predecessor uh, as a polio chair, while we were in Pakistan, traveling in Pakistan, uh, a lady and uh, her daughter, uh, both polio workers, were shot dead in uh, in the border town of uh, Quetta. Again, her her fault her her fault was no more than basically just wanting to uh, eradicate polio and save children from the from this crippling disease. But more importantly, the politics behind it that that was after it it was was basically trying to discredit the whole effort to build relationship, build mutually beneficial, mutually respectful relationships amongst Pakistanis and uh, Rotarians around the world, including Western Rotarians uh, and Canadian Rotarians. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, everybody followed uh, the, the comeback of Taliban uh, last year. As Taliban were rolling into uh, into the big cities. Uh, unfortunately, there were only about 37 Rotarians on the ground in Pakistan. Uh, a lot of them, especially the women, opted to leave the country. Uh, and so right now, all the polio eradication efforts that are being carried out in Afghanistan are being carried out by basically our partners from WHO and UNICEF. And that also, uh, that's, that also actually confirms the reason why even though Rotarians have a very large network of our own, it makes sense to build peace and resolve conflict in partnership with other partners as well, who at times will be more effective than us. Um, so the vaccination process continues. How valid are the numbers that are coming out of Afghanistan right now? I don't know. But the last information is that Taliban uh, regime is allowing uh, WHO staff uh, to go door to door and uh, vaccinate kids. Now, the big hurdle in Afghanistan is that Taliban has recently banned uh, women polio workers, women pol polio um, healthcare workers altogether, right? In a deeply conservative society like Afghanistan, where a lot of women are not even allowed to step outside the house, it, it's posing a very unique challenge uh, over and above every other challenge that was already there in that if women health workers cannot visit these houses and can't see uh, the ladies in the house, uh, you know, how do we make sure that they are actually having the right conversation, educating the mothers uh, or anybody else in the family while they're vaccinating children, right? So anyways, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot, of, lot, lot there that, you know, hopefully uh, the information coming out is correct, but we're going to have to keep an eye on in, in uh, quarters and years ahead uh, and see how it, uh, how it, how it comes to, uh, comes together. In case of Pakistan, though, um, it's pretty obvious that tide has turned. Uh, our Rotary International President Jennifer Jones visited Pakistan uh, last year and uh, was given full access to both uh, polio uh, centers as well, um, the government-run emergency center uh, where everything is being coordinated from and had had full briefing on the efforts being taken by Pakistani government. I have noticed that uh, the government of Pakistan has created an Urdu language and polio now uh, campaign of their own, uh, which is readily uh, uh, updated uh, on Facebook, right? They don't mention Rotary International. It's kind of interesting to see that. Uh, but nonetheless, the government is definitely making a 110% push. Uh, as a matter of fact, last two weeks, they were vaccinating, I think, over close to 40 million children uh, around the country. Uh, so the good thing is that the vaccinating part uh, and the healthcare part is moving on uh, in Pakistan. Uh, our incoming RA president, Gord McKinley, was uh, in Pakistan uh, as well uh, last year. And uh, I've, I've also seen some of the directors, uh, including uh, our own um, uh, former vice president for Rotary International and current chair of the uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion uh, Committee, Valerie Weffler also visit the country and meet uh, Rotarians as well as the government officials to, to learn about what's happening in the country. So in my humble opinion, I would argue that Polio Plus is actually the finest example 
of what uh, peace and conflict resolution is all about and how uh, Rotarians coming together here at home as well as with Rotarians elsewhere in the world can bridge uh, the dialogue gap that might exist between governments and, their, and other institutions uh, and can help build better relationships uh, and uh, uh, mutually beneficial relationships. One example I would like to leave you with before I, before I conclude my remarks, as Taliban were retaking the big cities in Afghanistan, one of the female Rotarians reached out to me uh, through the president of Canada Afghanistan Business Council. Uh, she was afraid for her life. She had spent a lot of time uh, in previous years advocating for women's rights and healthcare in particular. Uh, and so she wasn't sure how Taliban regime will handle her or treat her. Uh, at the time, uh, I approached the Canadian government through our local MP. Uh, and the Canadian government, quite frankly, hadn't streamlined the process by which they were evacuating people from Afghanistan. And so they couldn't, they couldn't really give me any answers. I was even in touch with the Canadian ambassador in Afghanistan at that point in time, who's now back in Canada. So I ended up, uh, so, and, and, I, and all of this happened while I kept uh, the RI, former RI pre uh, president, uh, uh, Shekhar Mehta in India, uh, and our uh, Rudra district leadership team, uh, Rudy Habash, as well as uh, uh, Sandhya Mani uh, in the loop. Uh, and one other person that was in the loop in this whole, whole process was the polio chair in Pakistan, Aziz Maimon, who's also a Rotary International trustee and an Arch Clump uh, donor himself. The reason I tell you that is, you know, after getting frustrated and not getting anywhere uh, with Canadian government, I ended up actually having this conversation with Aziz Maimon. And Aziz took it up directly with the foreign minister of Pakistan. And within seven days, uh, he was able to secure the uh, visas for Rotarian Nergis, the lady uh, Rotarian from Kabul, as well as her, her, her eight uh, family members. Initially, they flew out from Kabul and uh, stayed in Islamabad, Pakistan. Uh, they were home hosted by Rotarians in Pakistan uh, while they were in Pakistan. And eventually, a month later, they were able to get the visas to come to Canada. Uh, she's now uh, residing in Mississauga. and. Uh, it's my understanding from two weeks ago that she has recently gotten engaged. There is, so the reason I tell you that story is that um, not only are the Rotarians in Pakistan are dedicated towards eliminating the disease in Pakistan, but because of the goodwill us Canadian Rotarians have developed with them, they were able to assist us uh, evacuating an Afghan Rotarian while her family was facing a real threat. Uh, as Taliban retook uh, Kabul. Um, and so if that's not a fine example of peace and conflict resolution, then I don't know what it is. Uh, and that's, that's where I'm going to conclude my remarks, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Thank you very much, but our, there are actually two questions. Um, Mary Brady um, has a question that I, I'll get, um, Give you over to uh, Mary, and she will ask the question. Uh, yeah, Bedar, I'm just curious. I know um, during the the COVID years, <laughs> um, we started end up having polio in the U.S. Is that still a case? Is that still happening? Um, I haven't heard anything about it lately, and I'm just curious if it's still so close to home. It is. I, I appreciate you bringing this up. Uh, unfortunately, this this goes back to my earlier comment that when it when it comes to viruses, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. Um, there are two ways you can get a polio virus. One is wild polio virus, virus, uh, which is uh, just a transmission of uh, uh, polio virus. Uh, and second, second is uh, what they call virus. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, vaccine derived uh, case of polio. Um, so a vaccine-derived case of polio could simply be somebody who has recently received the vaccine traveling uh, and the virus, so some vaccines still use a live polio virus uh, and, uh, you know, through the, through the human body excretion, uh, that virus can actually enter the water systems in other cities wherever they are traveling. And that was the case with New Jersey, uh, where uh, unfortunately uh, a local uh, person ended up uh, uh, getting paralyzed uh, from polio. Uh, and same was the case actually in England. 
Um, so he, here's the scary part. Uh, when they did the, the testing of uh, the population in the county where the, the guy in New Jersey uh, ended up uh, getting paralyzed, they found out that 35% of the population was not vaccinated at all. Uh, and, you know, a part of me is actually not surprised, uh, given what I saw in terms of uh, the behavior of a lot of Americans towards COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, but it's also very scary that there are so many people not too far from us uh, with that kind of uh, lack of vaccination. So since then, the state of New York, as well as other states in the United States um, and the province of Ontario um, uh, are monitoring our water supplies. Okay, I haven't seen anything uh, in terms of them finding anything in Ontario but the vigilance is now definitely uh, uh, elevated. Great, thanks, Bedar. Yeah. Um, Did you, Kathy? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Kathy, yes, please. I'm sorry, Suzanne, I, I just wanted to add, um, Bedar, do you think that um, getting back to the relationship with peace and polio, um, that all the migration that is happening right now, the people leaving um, less peaceful countries, people, be for more peaceful countries crossing borders illegally and this sort of thing is only going to heighten the um the possibility of spreading this disease even more absolutely there's uh, there's already um, a lot of afghan refugees and even pakistani uh, refugees illegals uh that actually go through afghanistan iran and from iran into turkey and through turkey uh to europe a lot of that is done, unfortunately, illegally through uh, smugglers and stuff like that. Uh, if these people are not vaccinated or if they have recently been vaccinated and they're carrying uh, the, 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 uh, the live polio virus because of the vaccination process, it is entirely possible that it can spread into Europe and even from Europe uh, into, into North America. Uh, so it goes back to the fact that, uh, you know, we do need to continue on with our work for the next little while. Uh, one of the things I should mention is that for a country to be uh, labeled polio free, it has to remain polio free. It has to not report any new cases for three years after the last case. Uh, and so, you know, uh, when I did this presentation, well, uh, regular provided a regular update to my club. Somebody asked why we're raising the kind of money we're raising if there's only two countries remaining. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why we're doing it is because the research on the virus, uh, on the vaccines continues. We are continually trying to improve the vaccines themselves. But more importantly, um, the vaccination process is actually a global process. And it's from a prevention perspective. So while the two countries are polio endemic, we actually do spend a lot of money still vaccinating, for instance, children in Mexico. There are Rotarians from our district that have traveled to Mexico regularly to help uh, uh, vaccinate children in Mexico, right? Uh, Mexico has been polio free for a long time, but from a prevention standpoint, we we'll continue to do that. Uh, India has a huge population. India became polio free uh, some almost a decade ago. And uh, but because it's a big population, the vaccination process still continues there. Um, and so, you know, that's where a lot of the funds that you're using are going. Not everything we're raising goes to Pakistan uh, or Afghanistan, but a lot of it goes into research, into making sure the supply chains are effective, and then also the preventative uh, vaccination process. Thank you. Um, there are, in the meantime, a couple more questions. So. Mike S. would like to know how many members have pledged $100 or more until now from our district? Uh, we've got about 44 uh, members now that are part of the Polio Plus Society. Okay. And to, to, to the same um, kind of topic, uh, Uche would like to know, with about 1,400 Rotarians in our district, he sees low subscriptions to both Polio Plus Society and the polio t-shirts in the districts. Um, do you know why that is? Uh, well, I think the polio t-shirt part is easy. First of all, the you know, shipments that we were expecting uh, arrived a little late uh, as compared to when we were supposed to get because it was done during COVID, uh, COVID, COVID and supply chains weren't necessarily working as efficiently. So we have sent uh, 
emails out. I just did a presentation to Rotary Club of Cambridge last week. It was an in-person uh, presentation. And I actually asked people how many people had actually heard of our uh, our Polio Plus Society, as well as the fact that we were providing polio shirts. And I was amazed that actually majority of the people in the club hadn't heard it. So I had to remind them that we did send multiple emails out. Uh, in, and I think there was one even with a picture uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the polio shirts, uh, as well as the Polio Plus Society. So maybe in the next communication, we'll send another email blast out uh, to everybody in the district. But uh, President Ruja, it's definitely work in process and uh, we're going to continue working at it. Could be that they're not really good for women as well. That's entirely possible. Yeah, I I wouldn't wear it no. <laughs> as a woman, the style. That's all. That's yeah. all I'm saying. If you had something that actually women would want to wear, maybe your numbers would be up. <laughs> Fair enough. That, that's good feedback. If, if they and, do and something it's like it's white too, point. right? It's white. Right? It's white. It's a white blue shirt. and white. It's blue and white. Okay, yeah. I only saw the white version. It seems. Okay. Yeah. No, there are some blue blue ones as well. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Kieran has a, a question, and then we have one more um in the chat. So this and is I think I think Nagwa has her. And Nagwa up. has one too. Sorry. So just yeah. on a lighter note, Bada, the shirt I got for that. Is it not uh, women's shirt? Is it men's shirt? Uh, so they are, are supposed to, they, they are supposed to be asexual, but you know, uh, it, um, I I don't know. I'm not a woman. This is a very tough question for me to answer. <laughs> but as I, I was told that they're they're uh, that both men and women can wear them, but you know, the style is a little bit older, uh, and so I know that. From a fashion perspective and from a North American perspective and Canadian perspective, it, it looks a little bit dated. Because I haven't opened it as yet. There was no occasion to, then I would have come to know otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we go to Nagwa's um, questions as she has her hand up, um, Mike S. Um, writes, in the world statistic of the happiest countries, Canada was number five happiest in 2015. Now number 13, what could be the reasons? <laughs> COVID? That, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's very true. I think that we went through a very difficult time during COVID and um, there, it seemed like the country was split between vaccinators and anti-vaxxers. And then we had that demonstration in Ottawa and uh, I, I think that's probably one of the reasons why we slipped from the mo 10th most peaceful country to the 12th. Yeah. That's my guess, but I don't well, know. The the entire well, the, the politics around the whole, whole uh, situation didn't help. No. Uh, a, a lot of it just added undue stress and uh, undue friction between uh, local community members. Uh, and uh, some of it actually continues to play out. Um, and I find that, so I'm gonna tell you something about myself. I've always been a, a little bit of an A-type personality, always on the go. Uh, and you know, I, I find that after COVID, I, my, my, my thought processing and decision-making process, in my opinion, is a little delayed. It's a little bit more cautious as compared to what it was before, right? So, so, so from a psychological perspective, I'm pretty sure all of us have been impacted negatively one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, for showing the, the blue version of the shirt. <laughs> and uh, over, oh, thank you. That looks actually okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that better than white, Badar. All um, right. I, we can change we have it. One more question. Um, yes, one more question. Um, Nagwa, please. Have a, uh, let's have a comment after. Thank you. Yeah. Nagwa? Badar, thank you for interesting presentation. I would like to understand how can a member join the Polio Plus Society? Is that by donating $100 once yeah, if, so or if every you... month or how much? <laughs> so the email communications that were sent out by Foundation Chair 
uh, Leslie Bermani has suggested that uh, anybody interested should email me. Uh, and once I have their email, I would send them, I would email them a form, a pledge form that they would sign and send back to me. Uh, and that's about it. Then they just go online and make a donation to Bully Plus under the RI on their own and we're good to go. Yeah, but that's once only, or like I know the foundation was required $1,000 to get the polio, uh, to get uh, the poll harvest. So, in yeah, this so it's, it's annual until polio is eliminated. So you are <laughs> pledging that you will do it on an annual basis. So annually for $100, tells the polio more. is eradicated. Yes, Kat. PDG Kathy. Yeah, um, I just oh, want to add, that. I just want to add, Nagwa, that when you go on there and do your $100 donation to polio, you just put recurring, okay? It's it's a recurring donation. Now, so if, could, okay. if you if you do it on March the, the 1st, you will get a note back saying that you will be charged that $100 next March the 1st. Okay. And until, until you stop it, until Bedar said uh, polio is eradicated. Until Bedar is. Okay. Thanks, Kat. <laughs> and, and if I may add, if you don't want to do the $100 in one go, you can actually also choose to make it, say, monthly. That's what I do because I'm a member yeah. of that society. Every month, yeah. I just pay about maybe $12 or something. And then Absolutely. at the end of the year, I make up $100. That's great. Yeah, you can do that too. Karen, there's one more question, please. Uh, uh, yes, Suzanne. So I asked that question yesterday also. Like, uh, I am regularly, I pay $100 for my annual uh, annual fund. So if I change that to polio fund, does that mean same to me for my Paul Harris Fellowship? So I, I, I'm careful in answering that question because I don't want to cannibalize uh, anybody, anybody's else's budget, but yes, technically it does. <laughs> because since long I had been doing that, that won't be a, uh, this thing for me. I can start doing that for Polio Plus, but uh, does it mean same for being a Paul Harris Fellow for the, from that? Yes, it does. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Suzanne, can I just add one comment? Absolutely, you... please. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to expand on that peace poll that I was talking about. And I said the cost of the peace poll was 500 plus, but that's the cost of the peace poll, okay? Now we got a district grant to do this little peace area because we had to have the peace poll installed. It has to go in the ground. It has to be cemented in. We had a sign made up to explain rotary and what a peace poll is. And we had a couple of trees planted and a bench, okay? So the reason we did the uh, district grant was to pay for all of this, which came to over $9,000. So I just thought I'd clarify that. The Peace Poll itself is not the biggest expense. It's cooperating with your municipality, uh, the Parks Commission, um, what they allow, what they don't allow. So. It depends on your area, but if you have the um, if you have someone who is more flexible, you could do the work yourself and save save some money. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. If there are no more questions, I will hand it over back to uh, Mary for our final words. Thank you so much for everybody attending, um, Badar and Kathy. Excellent presentations. Uh, always learn a lot when uh, when you guys are talking about a lot of it. And every time I hear you talk, Kathy, I I want to get more involved in the peace stuff. Like every single time. So I'm going to make a pledge because I'm president elect nominee. I am going to uh, try and get our club to be a peace club, a peace builder club. So that's going to be my 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 commitment and one of my goals in my year. So. Um, you can count on that. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that our next presentation uh, is going to be tomorrow evening at seven o'clock. It's on community service and Norma Gamble is going to be our presenter. Uh, so thank you again for everybody. The recording, the, this has been recorded and we will make the recording available in a couple of days on the website uh, if anybody wants to um, review it or send it to other people to be able to watch it.
And if there's nothing else, we'll say goodbye. Thank